for the digitally connected telco. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, talking a little bit about the uh, telecom industry, uh, what's happening right now, uh, the big transformations that are, going to, are happening. Uh, then I'm going to talk about this uh, little company, uh, WSU Telco, uh, pretty much an upstart going against uh, the big giants, the incumbent vendors uh, in, the, in the mobile domain. Um, and finally, of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the products WSU Telco has brought to market, uh, some of our customers, etc. Okay, so let me get started. Uh, so this, this slide is, uh, as I said, about giving a little bit of background and context. Now, uh, the telecom um, uh, industry is essentially the case study for every single technology S-curve. There's been so many disruptions uh, generated through the telecom industry. It's affected everything from the way you, know, you, you do business to how you interact socially, how you entertain yourself, etc. So it touches everything. But it is an industry itself that has gone through several major transformations. So let's start with the, the old one, the, the fixed line communications, the old pay phones, the landlines, et cetera, that sit in your houses. Uh, those, of course, gradually evolved to data, you know, fiber to the home, et cetera, you know, new services getting deployed. Uh, of course, then came mobile. Now, uh, Mobile uh, has really revolutionized, uh, especially you know, emerging markets, you know, places like you know, India, Sri Lanka, where, the, where it's predominantly greenfield deployments, uh, where there's no copper on the ground, no fiber in the ground, et cetera. Uh, mobile has really driven reach. Uh, of course, the final thing there with mobile is you know, it's, not, you know, it's not like you're going to take, your, you know, take a pay phone in your back pocket. Most people here, probably look at uh, their mobile phones. Uh, I think there was a statistic of over 100 times, an average smartphone user. So the affinity the mobile phone has brought has been the transformation, has been the big change from the fixed line. Uh, the final point, the next transformation that has been happening perhaps in the last uh, sort of 10 years or so, this is an in the impact of the internet age on what has you know, traditionally been you know, the, the showcase of technology, et cetera. So here, this is, this is uh, no longer around you know, about selling you know, voice minutes. It's no longer about selling SMSs. It's not, not the you know, quota of data, et cetera. This is all about uh, wallet share for a, for a mobile operator. This is about digital services. And the digital services transformation is enabling is about operators striving to become part of any transaction, whether that be e-commerce, a financial transaction, uh, you know, advertising, all of those things. That is uh, a mobile operator's ambition. Now, whether they're achieving it or not, that's, that is the challenge. That is what they're fighting against. Now, another interesting statistic is, um, as I said before, while the mob mobile the telco industry has been a massive industry, growing very rapidly, uh, actually, um, the, the stats say that it, it, we are likely going to see a dip of about 1% in top-line revenue next year. So this has got all the mobile operators around the world very worried and thinking about you know, how they are going to adjust to this new, more dynamic environment where it's these new digital services which become the new battleground. Uh, so, so let me just give you a little bit of background to this slide and, and first explore, explain the Rhino. Um, so I, I put a title there, an MNO. So MNO, uh, and I know the WSO2 guys always make fun of all my acronyms. Uh, MNO is a mobile network operator. Uh, and the little Rhino sitting on, on a cable. Um, I mean, that's a favorite slide in lots of the presentations we use. Uh, I quite like it um, because it tries to capture, uh, you know, the, really the dilemma of a mobile operator trying to, you know, trying to survive in this environment. Uh, and I've, I've also labeled, uh, those are actual stats uh, from the sixth largest mobile operator group in the uh, world. I haven't named them because that would be bad, and they're a shareholder, and that could get me into trouble. Uh, I hope this is not being recorded now anyway, so it's too late. Uh, so, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, if you're comparing WhatsApp to, you know, a 
I would say actually probably one of the more innovative operator groups. You're looking at a head count, a difference between 55 versus 25,000. Massive difference. Uh, you're looking at a very mature business that has been in operation for 25 years versus less than a decade. And if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, uh, you can already see that WhatsApp messages have, you know, globally exceeded, globally, now this is one mobile operator, globally exceeded the number of SMSs uh, that are going on there. And finally, the uh, last, last point there, um, that I, you know, I think it's really important from the context of this presentation. It's about how agile you are, how quickly you can release a product. Now, a mobile operator, uh, typically, you know, if it's a 4G network, if it's a major network rollout, et cetera, you're looking at something that happens uh, every you know, seven or eight years, that kind of time scale. Uh, a value-added service uh, or you know, like a mobile advertising product, et cetera, typically would be in, in about a year's time to take to market. Now, this is not acceptable if you're trying to get to that next S-curve and you're challenging those internet companies who are playing in this digital services domain. So this is really the opportunity space uh, that WSO2 Telco is trying to address. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, comparing the two. Uh, uh, mobile network operator, an over-the-top or uh, you know, internet service provider, uh, sorry, internet uh, company, and how they're different. Uh, and there are some very big differences. Uh, for instance, uh, mobile operators, as I said, they are entrenched in the incumbent business models, the voice minutes, the SMS, the data. Now, you can't forget those. Those are what's been generating the, you know, the revenue for the last 25 years. Those are the big numbers. But it's changing. They almost always are in markets that are saturated. Now, um, you know, in the last sort of 10, 15 years, some of the emerging markets have been the places the large operator groups have expanded to. Because mobile penetration is low, you know, uh, earning power is going up, people are starting to use more and more of these services. So you see growth in traditional services. But still, you know, you get two or three mobile operators in the market selling the same services, usually competing on price. Saturated market. Uh, you're constrained by all kinds of uh, regulatory things as a mobile operator. So for instance, in, in the UK, you've got a uni universal service uh, obligation. So now this is not something that any internet company has to deal with, but any mobile operator, fixed line operator in BT would be fined significantly for violating the terms of this. Um, and just some background, what that means is the same service needs to be available at the same price for everybody all over the country, and there's a bunch of rules around service availability. So a mobile operator's network has to be you know, rock solid. You know, nuclear bomb goes off, it should still keep running. Uh, it's billing system. Um, and if you take a developing market, for instance, where you get a lot of prepaid, typically a prepaid billing system goes down uh, within about a day, the, the company will be making a loss. Within a couple of days, the company would be out of business. That is, that is the kind of availability, the, uh, uh, how solid uh, a mobile operator's core IT systems need to be. So as I mentioned, in this environment, everything is managed around managing cost, delivering these core services in the most cost-effective manner. Now, one thing that's a, 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 you know, a, a strong advantage that mobile operators still have with most customers is they have a billing relationship. There's a bill that goes to a customer every month, they pay something, they go to, you know, in a prepaid market, they go do top-ups, et cetera, so there's a billing relationship, which is significant. Uh, and that is really a tool that actually, that's an advantage that can be taken over to, taken to the digital services domain. Now, on the, on the other side of the fence, uh, the competitors in the digital service domain, the internet companies, now, they've got a completely different set of rules. Uh, typically, you know, it's a small company. Um, I think, you know, Ashok was talking about all the little startup companies, you know, running services on the cloud. The barriers to entry are minimal. You know, these days you could, you know, get a server on Amazon with a credit card and run a service, and if it works, it works. If it, not, it doesn't, you can, you know, iterate it, you can change things. If it doesn't work, you shut it down, and hey, you can find another job because 
there's lots of startups and there's lots of other companies that you know will hire you if you're a good engineer. So the the, the thing what this is driven is it's it's driven a change in mindset. So a typical uh, mobile operator, they'll be very focused on their local market. So if you take you know Dialog in Sri Lanka, the company that I used to work for. Uh, really focus on market share in Sri Lanka. It's all about gaining market share in Sri Lanka, uh, market penetration, et cetera, et cetera, in Sri Lanka. Now, uh, a WhatsApp or an internet startup, or for that matter, even a small you know, company in Sri Lanka you know, running a new, new startup, they won't be thinking about Sri Lanka. You know, you know, the, the, the line that, that's very common in the, in the startup industry is uh, think big, start small. So these internet companies aren't thinking local. They may address a local problem, but they're always thinking, you know, why should I restrict myself to you know, just the dialog customers who you know, are 30, 40% of the population when I can reach all the mobile operators in the country or potentially the world? So that mindset really drives a completely different thing. So this is really about the culture of the organizations. And you know, as I said, this technology is about trying to bridge this gap. But mobile operators themselves are undergoing a, you know, a change management where they are trying to be more nimble, more agile. That little you know, rhino needs to be hopping across the, across the cable. And that's the change that needs to, that needs to happen. So the company itself, um, as, as was um, in, in the great intro, <laughs> uh, it, it's a joint venture. Uh, between uh, Dialog, uh, sorry, Dialog Asiata, uh, and actually more specifically Asiata Digital Services, uh, and also WSO2. Uh, so to give you a little bit of background, uh, this started, um, I mean, you know, a couple of years ago, I was just like yourselves. We've di we downloaded the uh, WSO2 software. We had particular problems that we needed to address as a telco, you know, stay ahead of the curve that I was talking about. And we built a solution. And it started in Sri Lanka, then got deployed in multiple Asia operators. And it was clear that there was an opportunity to, uh, to, go, to go beyond Asia footprint. And the joint venture was really a, a vehicle to uh, uh, execute on that opportunity. And then we got set up. So that's the background story to the company. I'm going to go on to talk a little bit more about our products. Um, of course. Um, as was mentioned during the panel discussion also, WSO2 software is built to work on-premise cloud hybrid. Uh, it runs on a common carbon platform. All of these things we inherit. So out of the box, our products um, work very, very similar to WSO2 products as they do. Uh, we have built uh, three uh, specific uh, products and one managed service. Uh, I will talk about those in more detail in the coming slides and also talk about some of the case studies, et cetera, associated with them. So the first one, uh, now, for the first product, the identity server. Uh, I really can't tell you much about the uh, identity server without giving you a background to Mobile Connect. Um, so Mobile Connect is uh, a GSMA initiative around uh, addressing the same problem that we talked about earlier, about how mobile operators can remain relevant in, a, in an internet arena, in internet world. So Mobile Connect is a federated identity service similar to uh, Facebook Connect, et cetera. Uh, but instead of passwords, it's using your device. Instead of a username, it's using uh, your phone number. So inherently, it addresses lots of usability issues with passwords. For instance, uh, there's a stat there that says 68% you know, of users uh, forget their passwords. They need to keep resetting them every month. Uh, and uh, one of the, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys have the same problem unless you use a password manager. Ma you know, maintaining you know, 100 passwords, secure passwords for 100 different sites is, is not, not a tenable solution. And Mobile Connect is about addressing that customer need, bringing to bear some operator assets that make it unique. So uh, I'll go into that in more detail in a second. But bringing in some network layer integrations to a mobile operator, you can have a much better user experience, a much secure user experience. 
uh, and start to position Mobile Connect as a genuine competitor to some of these other uh, federated authentication services. And also, in some ways, start to offer very unique and different use cases also. Uh, and one little point, a very important point, uh, I should have mentioned, uh, currently, um, the GSMA, as part of this global initiative, have been pushing, um, uh, they called it Project 1 billion. But uh, halfway through, it then became Project 2 billion. Uh, and it was a major initiative to enable customers to use Mobile Connect. Uh, and currently, uh, the number stands at about 2.5. Uh, actually, I think the latest number yesterday I was at a presentation is 2.8 billion. So 2.8 billion users around the world can potentially use Mobile Connect. That means if they go to a service provider that has a Mobile Connect login, they could click, their button, uh, click this button and experience Mobile Connect for themselves. Uh, and uh, WSU2 Telco platform actually is already enabling about 40% of these logins because we've been part of this program from the very beginning and one of the pioneers in this space, actually. So the mobile identity, uh, the Connect server, uh, there's, I'm not going to talk about some of the details uh, on the slides, but just to give you a flavor of these network layer integrations that I was referring to. So I'm sure most people here have used uh, SMS OTP, uh, one-time passwords that come uh, in SMSs. Now, this is usually used as a second-factor authentication. It's an out-of-band authentication. It checks whether you have a device with you, et cetera. And to the most part, they do the job, but uh, it's an awful mobile experience. If you ever try to swap between an SMS code, et cetera, it's, it's messy, it's a pain. Uh, it's also not very secure. Uh, you could have um, Trojans on your smartphones, et cetera, that can start hijacking these things. Now, the mobile connect authenticators that are in the form of uh, USSD, et cetera, are, are much better, much more secure, and start to address some of these usability issues. And I'll show you a demo of how it works in a second. It'll be, it'll be clearer. Uh, so the idea is that um, depending on the level of security that a service provider requires, uh, level of assurance two or level of assurance three, the, the, serv the identity server can provide a different level of authentication. So level of assurance two refers to the fact of whether you have your phone with you. So that's the same as a uh, SMS OTP. But an LOA three is asking the question, do you have your phone with you and do you know your password or PIN? And all of this is managed dynamically, uh, built on OpenID Connect. So this, this is a little demo. I hope we can, is it going? Oops, back. OK, so this is a mocked up login experience. Um, so very similar to Facebook Connect or Google Plus. This is the selection of the authenticator. This can actually be done dynamically by the mobile operator if they want to. Uh, and I should have just told you that on the right hand side is a, is a mobile phone screen. And on entering the mobile number, uh, so this is first time, so it's a registration. So after registration is done once, you don't actually see that screen again. Uh, so on the right-hand side, you can see a little USSD prompt come into your phone, uh, which you respond to saying you're okay to log in. And then the login is complete. So um, what I just showed you was one of the authenticators. Uh, there's another one, um, we refer to it as the header enrichment authenticator. That one actually uses mobile data. So if you're on an operator's uh, 3G, 4G network, et cetera, uh, you don't even have to enter your phone number. You just click the button. It knows where you're coming from because the network is doing some authentication, and it logs you in seamlessly. Uh, the, other one, uh, the other one that's, uh, I guess, starting to become more popular with things like FIDO and smartphone uh, uh, biometrics, et cetera, are smartphone uh, authenticators. So a very similar experience. Uh, different to the uh, USSD prompt that you saw, you'd have a smartphone that is actually generating a richer user experience, providing some 
uh, background showing you uh, what service provider you're logging into, et cetera. So that's what Mobile Connect looks like. Um, and this slide is a, um, um, is a schematic explaining how it works. So as I said, um, Mobile Connect is a global initiative. So uh, the expectation is there'll be multiple mobile operators around the world. Each of them would be an IDP, they, uh, identity provider. They will have their own identity services that are compatible with Mobile Connect. So if you're logging into Amazon, you know, I'm logging into Amazon, how, how do they know that you know, I'm, you know, this is a Sri Lankan number, et cetera? So the GSMA has proposed a set of standards around discovery, around identifying an operator, et cetera. So that process, uh, that component is referred to as a GSMA exchange. So, so there's a call out first to GSMA exchange, identifying which operator um, a particular customer belongs to. And it does this either using IP address or the person's phone number, uh, et cetera, and routes them to the right relevant identity gateway. So once it gets to the relevant identity gateway, then it becomes a open ID Connect uh, compliant. Uh, there's a mobile Connect profile based on open ID Connect. And this starts to then implement an authentication flow that, uh, that I just demonstrated. So uh, this slide is talking about uh, an actual deployment of Mobile Connect. Uh, it's a very large deployment, and this is, uh, this is actually you know, starting to hit about 900 uh, million customers uh, in India. So it's a massive achievement. It's, it's very new. It's, uh, it's, uh, the, it's launched with a couple of uh, you know, small applications, service providers, et cetera. Uh, but we are expecting very soon to be a massive um, above-the-line campaign and a ma massive push by the service providers. Then we expect to see these, you know, this uh, 900 million customers making much larger number of transactions on the platform. Uh, so we are integrated to uh, six uh, of the largest mobile operators uh, in India. Uh, and for this service, um, what we've deployed is, and I'll talk to you a little bit about it later on, uh, our managed, managed hub product that enables all of these operators to, um, without any or minimal integration efforts or deployments in their own networks, integrate to our hub. And in the hub, we can, man we can maintain a single consistent user experience across all of the six operators. Now, this is a challenge because, as I mentioned before, uh, mobile operator, operators, they, you know, they understand, yes, yes, we are losing our lunch to the OTTs, the internet companies. But when it comes down to it, in their markets, they, their natural tendency or instinct is to compete. So getting them together on one platform like this has been a major achievement. Uh, for both for us and for the GSMA. And uh, it's actually demonstrated what a commitment the Indian operators have to this Mobile Connect initiative. Uh, so so what, this, what does this hub mean? So for a service provider, it means there's a single point in India that, uh, let's say, you know, Flipkart, now you know, one of the biggest uh, e-commerce operators in, in India. Uh, some ways valued more than some of the mobile operators themselves, uh, which is another story. Uh, they can now integrate to all of, these uh, all of these operators, experience or use mobile connect identity services, uh, have or gain the benefits of higher conversions, et cetera, because more, you know, people don't forget their passwords, all of those things, and higher security authentication, et cetera. Of course, uh, the other advantage of this kind of deployment, which is very different to a typical tel telco deployment is we are iterating the product. Now we have put it to, uh, it's, it's live in India now. We are launching different use cases, et cetera, that haven't been implemented anywhere in the world or even have been thought of as part of the original Mobile Connect specification. Uh, but this kind of platform and this kind of approach lets you do it. Okay, so the other product that we have, uh, which is the external gateway, um, external gateway hub. Now, this this component is really about addressing um, the the the, the two-phase IT that you have in any mobile operator, uh, the the bulletproof billing systems, uh, IT systems that need to have you know five nines availability, versus 
the crazy, wacky services that are built or applications that are built in a hackathon by some university students. So this layer is about bridging to these two domains, enabling uh, rapid partnering, uh, generating an ecosystem to drive innovation, but at the same time ensuring the lights stay on and none of those core services that are the lifeblood of an operator are affected. So our product um, our gateway, external gateway product, uh, has a number of uh, APIs based on the GSMA1 API standard, but since subsequently iterated and improved. Uh, and they cover things like, you know, the standard easy stuff, SMS, uh, operator billing, uh, USSD, location-based services. Uh, but some of our customers have started implementing other APIs, such as, you know, digital rewards, mobile money, uh, etc. So these are the things that start crossing over to the digital services domain. And the uh, hub version of this product is, uh, again, another ha hub component that enables not just one operator to use the platform, but multiple operators. So this is, again, a, a sort of a, a mechanism for consolidation. If an operator doesn't want to do an on-premise deployment of a gateway, they can use a managed cloud-hosted version of a hub. Of course, they won't have all the flexibility of a local deployment, et cetera, but they get the low cost. So this uh, very, very pretty picture uh, is trying to explain the interactions between our hubs and gateways. Uh, so the hubs are essentially about aggregating multiple operators about giving a single endpoint to a service provider that can integrate to multiple operators at the same time. It becomes a point where um, a single point of integration, a single point of contracting, a, a single point of engagement for the SP. Now, this is a major issue given the number of mobile operators even in one country. Uh, a hub can be used by an operator group. So for instance, like the Asiata group, and there's a case study. I'll just quickly go to that in a second. Uh, it can be used by uh, an in-country deployment, for instance, the India deployment that I was referring to uh, is, exactly, uh, is exactly this, uh, versus a gateway. And a gateway, as I said, is about driving your own ecosystem. And this is thinking about an operator's uh, natural tendency to think local. So this is about addressing their need to, uh, uh, to service the enterprise customers. And if they have one, their own, you know, develop engagement programs, et cetera. Uh, so this, uh, this example is, is talking about another deployment, um, this time Asiata. Uh, and this was obviously the first deployment we did, we set up. Uh, and this is about integrating all of Asiata's operators. Uh, there's five integrated now. Uh, there are seven Asiata operators. Uh, um, the others also in the pipeline, and they will get integrated soon. But what this means is, for a regional service provider, let's say a, you know, a Google or a Coca-Cola or, or a Unilever wanting to engage with this region, they have a single point to do an integration. They have a single point to negotiate a contract, and they have a single point to agree commercials. Now, the technology is easy. All the other stuff is hard. Uh, and it took a while to get all of this going, but the service is now live, and it is generating a lot of traction, simply because it is normally so painful to work with mobile operators. So anything we do to help this process, uh, the service providers uh, jump on it, because they understand the, the reach of the mobile operators, what they can do, et cetera. It's just about bringing the, breaking the barriers and making it easier for them to partner. So this particular use case is focusing on a, um, a deployment, on a, on a gateway deployment in a specific operator in Dialog. Uh, so this is an interesting one, because the, the previous one, as I said, is targeting regional players. This is something that would target an in-country player. Uh, so to give you some background, this was um, uh, Vesak is a, is a Buddhist campaign. Uh, it's a Buddhist uh, religious holiday in Sri Lanka. And uh, Unilever, uh, Sunlight is a brand in Sri Lanka that's about, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's soap. So they, they run a campaign every year around bringing light to the nation in Vesak time. Uh, 
Uh, now, normally, people like Unilever or the marketing agencies they work with, etc., they don't talk to mobile operators. The only time they talk to mobile operators is, is when they want to get you know, enterprise phone connection or data connectivity between officers or something like that. They talk to us sometimes through third parties to do mobile advertising. So that's bulk SMSs, things like that. But on the marketing side, they don't talk to mobile operators because mobile operators um, you know, take a long time to respond. They can't you know, launch services quickly. These guys are used to running you know, campaigns on Facebook, building smartphone apps. They are used to doing activations on the street, etc. Uh, so mobile operators are normally not the people to work with. But what's, uh, what's very interesting about this case study, this particular one, was uh, after you know, lots of workshops, a lot of convincing, um, the ad agency that was running this campaign on behalf of Unilever actually understood. And they were like, wow, we can do all these cool things. Of course, a week later, they wanted to launch a service. And that was a bit mad, and we were a bit concerned. But thankfully, the platform was already in place. The APIs were already there. And the service uh, went live in a matter of, uh, matter of days, not the, you know, the normal you know, you know, six months that it would normally take to deploy a service like this with a mobile operator. Um, sorry, I, I left out the most interesting part of this case study. What does this actually do? I should have told you that right at the start. So what, what happens here is that a mobile uh, a customer you know, who's you know, watched uh, or interacting with a Unilever uh, radio advert or a TV advert would make a missed call to a phone number. They would get an SMS indicating, you know, thank you for your call, we've received your call, uh, you have got a number, a lamp number, you know, 384. And what actually happened on Vesak Day, the day of this religious festival, there was a, a massive 9 foot by 100 foot uh, digital display uh, around this uh, Buddhist site. Uh, and these lamps lit up with uh, the customers' numbers on there, all, all in real time, all streamed, etc. So it was about generating brand engagement for Unilever. A, li a little idea, but it was very novel, it hadn't been done before. And, and the main thing is, um, we managed to convince Unilever that you could actually start doing things like this. So they will start building these applications and services now themselves, now that the APIs are available. So I talked a little bit about the uh, external gateway. Uh, now the internal gateway. Uh, the internal gateway is, uh, in lots of ways, addressing uh, a, a different set of uh, problems. Uh, with an internal gateway, as I said, you've got these telco systems uh, that have been there for ages, millions of dollars of investment, legacy systems that you generally can't touch. Now, this is a problem because you know, it, it stops innovation. There's not much you can do. If you want to do something, you get slapped with a CR from you know, Huawei or Ericsson or one of these big guys, and they charge lots of money. They do some testing, and, and you know, a year later, you'll notice that your um, competitors have got the same feature because one of these big vendors have implemented it in their roadmap. So this platform is about driving internal innovation by giving an abstraction layer and giving a mechanism for you to play outside these big boxes around moving the changes that would normally happen in these you know, network boxes into a layer that you can experiment and play with. Uh, so this is um, a case study uh, of Dialog again, where this internal gateway was deployed. And uh, again, this is a very new, uh, very new product for us also. Uh, but it's produced, uh, it's, it's got massive, uh, very impressive stats. So uh, in terms of uh, the reduction of CRs, now uh, a CIO in a mobile operator tends to have, you know, literally, you know, hundreds and hundreds of CRs they're expected to deal with. And they tend to do about, you know, 20 or 30 a year because that's what's feasible, et cetera, and then you realize they don't work, all these things. So. What this platform has enabled in Dialog is the ability to do these CRs much more quickly. So this is a quick comparison between the two, two gateways. And as I said, uh, the, main, the main point here is uh, internal versus external. Uh, a single team owning the external gateway. So as I mentioned, a single point to do the contracting, a single point to do the commercial negotiations versus an internal gateway 
Uh, and typically in a telco, you'll have a CRM team, you'll have a billing team, et cetera, et cetera. You, you'll have you know, half a dozen IT teams. And it's about managing governance, et cetera, for those people. And of course, finally, uh, with the external gateway, you've got you know, tens of APIs that you want to monetize. Those are commercial APIs versus the thousands of APIs that you'd have in an internal uh, gateway. Uh, finally, um, our managed hub service. So rather than a product, this is a service. Uh, currently, as I mentioned, the, uh, the ASIAD hub that I described deployed in Singapore, uh, the India Mobile Connect hub in India, and very recently, uh, another hub deployed in Dubai. Uh, and we are having discussions around having another deployment uh, in LATAM uh, and also in Europe. Uh, and the reason we are taking this approach is um, this is a space that is very much outside the comfort zone of a mobile operator, outside their DNA, against their culture, all of these things. Now, the fact that this gives them a route to try experimenting with some of these services without actually making a significant CapEx investment is, is significant. It get, it's just that little thing that gets them over the line. And also, uh, one of the points that I mentioned at the start that uh, mobile operators don't do so well, reach, going across, that starts to get addressed by these hubs and these hub-to-hub -hub, uh, integrations that can be done. So mobile operators or service providers can then start to work with mobile operators the same way they work with uh, the Facebooks, et cetera, that have an over-the-top uh, footprint. Uh, this managed service, uh, sorry, the managed hub offers both uh, the mobile connect service, identity service that I discussed, and also the API management capability of the external gateway. So uh, I've described the products. A uh, couple of other things are, are missing blocks in our roadmap. So you can make, you can build the enablers, you can build the things that make it easy for operators to build stuff. Of course, that's not everything because you want them to build, you know, not hundreds of stuff, thousands of stuff. So that means things like app creation tools, uh, et cetera, uh, you know, things like the WS2 App Factory. These are all things in our roadmap that we are looking to improve the developer experience. Start to get the, uh, the non-computer savvy guys, the business users, et cetera, starting to build applications them themselves. And of course, finally, to consume these services through an app store. Uh, okay, so uh, how do we sell this stuff? Uh, very similar to WSO2. Uh, uh, we employ exactly the same model, um, open source, development, uh, licenses free, et cetera. You only pay per JVM. You only pay for active uh, instances, et cetera. Uh, our managed service that I mentioned is on, uh, on a per transaction basis. There's, of course, a one-off integration setup cost, but after that, it's on a production uh, service. Sorry, it's on a per transaction basis. Uh, finally, the development support, again, very similar to WSO2 uh, and, and the consultancy and advisory services that we can offer. Uh, so how do we work with WSO2? So I think, I mean, you know, just in the... The couple of days today, a lot of people have asked me, okay, WSO2, oh, you're not WSO2, you're WSO2 Telco. What's that? So from the technology perspective, uh, what it means is that uh, there's no forking of the code. We are using the WSO2 uh, Carbon platform. Uh, we are developing software based on uh, you know, WSO2's advice, the, uh, you know, defined extension points, et cetera. We try to align the roadmap as much as we can. So if a customer tells us we want to do this, we, we look, you know, is WSO2 doing this? Is it something specific to the mobile domain? We'll build it, et cetera. Uh, essentially, what we are trying to do is uh, build a vertically integrated solution for the mobile industry based on the WSO2 products. So WSO2 will always build, you know, the best API manager and the best ESB, et cetera. But we will build the best digital enablement solution or platform for a mobile operator. Now, that's, that's the key message for us. Commercially, how do we work with uh, WSO2? So, I mean, just to reiterate, separate company, separate legal entity. Uh, we've got some of the same bosses, but, you know, on the board, et cetera, but uh, still separate companies. Uh, 
there are, if you buy a WSO2, or if you go to production with a WSO2 telco product, you'll be paying WSO2 telco production support, if you want it, just like the same way you do with WSO2 software. Uh, similarly, if you, I mean, as you all already probably do, you, you have WSO2 software, pay for WSO2 production. Uh, and there's no reason why you can't have, uh, be a customer of both entities. We work very closely. We sit in the same offices. There's a lot of alignment on the technology. Uh, and we will definitely work together to give you a seamless experience to make sure we address your needs between the two companies. So the last slide, uh, just a quick three bullet points on uh, the transformation in the telco, in the mobile network operator domain. Uh, so it's about moving from this cost leadership mindset to being more innovation driven. It's being more like an internet company. But at the same time, there's no reason why you can't do both. We, we can't forget what we've done well. We just need to learn how to do other things better. Rapid partnership and reach. If we can't you know, compete with them, you know, working with them, you know, being, getting part of that value, uh, getting part of that value chain, getting part of that uh, uh, wallet share is enough for a mobile operator because that is no longer just voice data and, um, and SMS. Now it's everything, everything you do with, in your digital lifestyle. Finally, it's back to the rhino on, on the wire. It's about having the agility, but still having the telco grade availability and keeping those systems up. OK, that's all for me.